I can remember being shown a report, which was from the ambulance turning up after they'd found his body. These are things that I just had not expected. So welcome to the podcast series, Death, A Changing Industry. Today I have the great pleasure to welcome the founder of Much Loved, Jonathan Davis. Jonathan, welcome to the podcast and a huge thank you for joining us today. I have lots of questions for you to go through. Uh, before we do that though, would you mind giving us a, a short introduction uh, of who you are and your background please? Yes, hi, good morning John, lovely to be here today. Um, uh, I am the founder of Much Loved, we are the in-memory service and what we do is we help bereaved people to, to create and also to keep um, beautiful and personalised uh, online memorial websites in memory of, of loved ones that have died. So I'm always intrigued uh, about people in this industry and and why they do the things they do. Um, and there's usually a story or an experience behind the, uh, this initiative. So what is your reason uh, on why you've done this? Uh, and is it, is it based on the personal experience of loss? Yes, you're right. It uh, was absolutely based on, on, on personal loss. And whilst I guess my story is not unique, um, it was um, something I was totally unprepared for uh, and devastating. So it was back in the 1990s and my younger brother was at uh, university. He was finishing his law degree at Birmingham um, and we got a call that he had died. And I, I suppose in terms of, of my experiences as a result of, of hearing this noise and, and um, suffering the loss of my brother, um, some things are, are maybe Quite familiar. I remember being told, for example, at the funeral, this is just a couple of weeks after he died, that I, it's now time for me to effectively to man up and get back to work, um, help the family and uh, get going again. Um, and this was from an extremely kind natured, um, loving family friend. And, and I just remember freezing, thinking, what on earth? There was, there was no way that I was I was able to um, to contemplate or would want to be trying to do something like that. I was literally at the beginning of, of, of my grief journey. I think that it comes back to our nation's relationship with death because it's the unknown. Um, we're sort of saying things we think are helpful. Yeah, it, it emerged. He'd taken a drug at the, um, the Guild of Students, so on a night out. Um, and... You know, there was a lot of confusion as a result. This was totally unexpected. Um, in some ways, there was a, a period of almost, um, you could say it's tragically comic, looking back on it. Uh, I can remember um, going through my brother's checkbook and seeing all these um, these payments for sort of a, a character called Bugs. And I was thinking, well, was, was, you know, was this his drug dealer? Was this a, a life that we didn't know about? He was supposed to be doing his degree and... Uh, and then being told by his girlfriend, well, no, he was just doing checks to the, the Birmingham University Guild of Students with the acting bugs. Um, but it got, got darker than that. There was obviously a big police investigation. And um, what really happened as a result was there was a big wall of silence. We were trying to find out what had happened. We just wanted total transparency. Then obviously my brother's friends, they were very scared. Um, there's obviously been a group of them that had been um, um, taking recreational drugs. And really, what should have been happening in the grieving process then was I should have been getting to know my brother's friends. I, I moved, I just started my first job in, in London and I, I moved home with my parents. And again, um, the, the, the world I was in, uh, young people in their 20s, bereavement charities in those days either looked after parents who maybe lost uh, their partner or child or, or were specialised at supporting young children. If you're in your early 20s, there didn't seem to be anything for me. So I, I felt very, very lonely and going back to my parents was, was something that really worked for me. But I, I did see firsthand the, the trauma of my parents and the devastation of, of losing their, their child. Even after the, after the court case, it was two years, the, the, the inquest had been delayed, of course. Um, and so we then had to go through, through an inquest where, again, people were, I think, sympathetic to us, but the, the process, the, the sort of formal process, didn't really put bereaved people first. And I, I can remember sitting in, in, in front of the coroner being shown a report, which was from the ambulance turning up after, after um, they'd found his body, and then being shown a report that basically told me the, the weight of all my brother's vital organs. Um, yeah, and, and these are things that I just had not expected, realising in retrospect that his body had been opened up and uh, everything taken out. It's, 
is very difficult to process. So Jonathan, do you think then that if you'd learned about the emotions that we go through when we lose someone uh, that we love uh, and about death and the emotions we go through prior to, to losing Philip, do you think that would have helped you um, when actually you lost Philip? Anything would have helped. And, and I think you know, broader awareness, broader understanding. You mentioned earlier about um, people maybe saying the wrong thing and you can certainly be between a rock and a hard place, can't you? And if you want to help somebody who's suffered a, a, a really traumatic bereavement. No, I totally agree with you there. Um, and you know, what I'm saying about awareness, it's not about waking up every day and acknowledging you're going to die. It's about just having some awareness uh, and the result of that would be a better way of living. So from the loss of Philip, at what stage did you set up Much Loved? And when did you start to formulate the services that you provide now? The idea was was triggered by my brother's death. I think in, in simplistic terms, we um, I remember we were putting around uh, posters around the university trying to find out if people could come forward with information. And the internet was just becoming a thing. This is in, in, in the mid-1990s. Um, and I remember thinking, well, maybe there could be a website that could uh, be something that could could ask for information and let people know about my brother. And some of my darker moments often happened in the evenings. I, I can remember um, raging, actually, at, at, the, at, at, at the grave because the, the gates had been closed. It was after dusk and I just wanted to be near him at the, at, at the grave. And I sort of climbed over the sort of sharp posts and, you know, went in there. But I remember thinking, well, if you have a, a website, you can you can actually have a place that people can go to any time of the day. And it's been quite um, interesting once much stuff started, you see a lot of the peak use happens in, in the mid to late evening. I think people can be at a low ebb and they feel they can't necessarily call or share share time with with others that they would do during the daytime. I mentioned about the, the incident at, at the funeral and being told it was time to move on. Well, I, I realised if you had a website, that's that's a site that you can keep going for as long as as long as you want, and it allows you maybe to to give you permission to grieve for longer, to extend the grieving process. It doesn't close at a formal time, whether it's to to light a candle or to leave a message, or, or really just to spend some time. It's it gives you that that permission. That platform, like you say, uh, for that constant contact. And that's something that I talk about frequently on this podcast. It's about connection points. I think that's what you provide, isn't it? It's a constant connection points, which is there when you need it. So that's a fantastic facility and service to have. Yeah, it was never meant to replace the traditional forms of memorialisation and, and particularly conversation, continuing bonds and, and speaking. But I, what I realised it did is it did act as a trigger point. It, it allowed people to start a conversation and I kind of called it a grief icebreaker. Um, so, for example, it, it may be your uncle that just leaves a nice picture and that uncle where maybe you stopped talking about the death. You can then speak to him and say, thank you ever so much for posting the picture and dot 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 and it starts a real life conversation and that's that can be really really helpful so for those people who are listening or watching what is the actual main purpose of the site in the early years it was all about memorialization so it was all about giving people a place to remember and what we tried to do is create a digital space it was never about the amount of content and then that's made some of the differences between maybe um, social networks, which is much, much more about um, having that ongoing content delivery. We started really in, in about 2006, but really I don't think society was ready for an online tribute service. I think now it has become more of a, of a product. The way it's developed over the years is to get involved with things like uh, fundraising in memory or helping people share practical details of the funeral and the wake, blending really the, 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 the online memorialization along with some of the more um, more practical um, parts of, of, of early stage and bereavement. A personal question for you, Jonathan, if you're comfortable in answering. Has what you've done with Much Loved, has it helped you move forward with your grief from Philip? Has it helped you as a person grow and deal with that, that sad loss? I think one thing I haven't mentioned uh, is that the trial and the, and the coroner's case I mentioned after my brother died, the hope was that would have produced some kind of closure. It doesn't work like that. And a couple of months after the coroner's case, my mum my was diagnosed with cancer. Um, within a year, she was dead. Um, and she died only age 55. So, so actually, I talked earlier about how my brother's death had given me the idea of much loved. 
and, and made me think, well, this could work, this could help people, this would have been useful for me. Um, but, but the reality is, I think it was my mum's death that made me think, I'm going to do this. I, I went back home and I, I, I saw the, the, the pain that my mum went through um, and the disastrous grieving process. And even all this time now, I mean, I, I'm a sensible, normal person, uh, I, uh, but I, I know that it was the, the grieving process that can be pitiless and maybe contributed to my mum dying not long afterwards. And, and, and this is the point. It made me think, actually, doing something positive about grieving has real-world forward ramifications. It's not just about the past. It's about the people left behind. I thought, if I can make much love to help just a few people, then maybe that can help people. You know, get through is an, is an awful phrase. But it may help people in their process and actually may help them to be healthy in the future. So, um, so the, so the, that's why it's so personal to me. Trying to answer your question, I don't know if it's helped me move forward, but I, I think I had no choice. It's, it's just my character. I, I couldn't respond to my, my brother's death and then what happened to my mum without trying to do something. But from an outside point of view, uh, Jonathan, I think it's incredible what you've done. And it's a legacy, not just to you, but also to your brother and all your family. So a huge well done. Uh, to you and just a, a huge thank you. So what's the, the future of Much Loved? Where do you want to take it next? There, there was no master plan. It, I wanted to make Much Loved happen and I, you know, I may be a bit belligerent, but I just was going to do it. And it didn't really matter whether it, it succeeded or failed. I just felt it was the right thing to do. Over the years, um, once it started to take off, we started to get people using it and, and, and loving it. Um, that's where maybe reality kicked in. I realised I had to, to, to fund much love. Right? I've seen lots of services that were set up for similar good reasons that have gone by the wayside. And you can imagine what you want to do when you're trying to create a a, a, a space a, a space that people can trust and use. Is you can't you can't um, have adverts, and we work on a subscription basis, uh, and that's been able to to fund much love. So really. What's happened over the last few years is we've we worked more and more closely, particularly with the funeral sector, and that's where I see the future of Much Loved. We we love working with, with an industry which is full of people who for whom helping bereaved people and, and giving the most amazing service is a calling, helping within that in-memory space, whether that's um, community remembrance or one-to-one or -one remembrance, um, helping with websites and grief resources, maybe um, something like Grief Chat, which is a fantastic um, online counselling service. That's really exciting. And I think what you've done, how it was born, it was all for the right intention. And it's helped so many people. A huge thank you for your time today. Really, really interesting to learn about the service you provide and to also learn about you. I appreciate it. And, uh, and thank you for what you're doing as well in, in terms of um, um, being at the forefront of pushing for improved um, you know, education, awareness, support um, for all things um, uh, grief and bereavement. It's, um, it's a really fantastic initiative. Thank you, Jonathan. All the best to you. A huge thank you for watching our podcast, Death, A Changing Industry. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel as we have some fascinating guests lined up. Thank you so much.